2017 2018 and we have seen that this program has provided a real lifeboat to save vultures from extinction you all are aware that how diclofenac and uh, that kind of medicines have created a havoc to the vulture population and now there are very clear cut signals of population recovery in different pockets uh, of the country next please so cdd uh, is uh, treating all three uh, all critically endangered and endangered resident zips species in its priority list in fact uh, the government of india uh, ministry of environment forest and climate change under the ongoing scheme centrally sponsored scheme of integrated development of wildlife habitat they have also given priority to this endangered uh, uh, species vulture and they provide funding support under that scheme for in situ conservation of vulture in the country other than this the cgd provides technical support and uh, funding support for vulture conservation in in captivity so vulture conservation breeding pinjor has been identified uh, it is uh, as you all or aware this will be prakash dr vibhu prakash and his team they are managing this and this is uh, this is playing a role of coordinating zoos and uh, among different uh, conservation breeding centers next slide so since 2007 8 a lot of work has been done and we have successful example in pinjor and based on that experience a couple of advices have been issued manuals have been prepared and uh, uh, cjd is continuously trying to organize uh, uh, between all these conservation centers exchange of best practices and how but unfortunately some centers next slide some centers are doing population uh, vultures in captivity you can see that pinjor baksa and to some extent rani they are doing very well in fact pinjor is outstanding but some centers like junagadh hyderabad the performance is not that good so we need to brainstorm we need to analyze uh, why they are successful in some centers and why not in other centers and maybe from pinjor we need to transfer the best practices to all other these centers next slide please so uh, the way forward i think we need more such kind of workshops so that all vulture conservation breeding centers they come to the same level the genetic diversity of founder population should be determined that's very important because if the population in any conservation breeding center there is no exchange of bird between two centers or other center there will be inbreeding depression inbreeding problem so for that we need to study the genetic diversity and birds should be shifted i think right now hardly any exchange is taking place we need to give emphasis to exchange of birds from one center to another siblings should be shifted to the centers within the known distribution range of the state and we have uh, seen that 25 pairs of parent stock 25 pairs of f1 generation should be at least kept on in each center and we think that this is the right time when progenies of f1 generation could be released in the wild some uh, already some efforts have been made at rajabhat kawa vultures have been released in the wild after tagging and pinjor also but i think the time has come we from this uh, ex situ to in situ conservation and relation linkage has to be established more so uh, with these words i i conclude my presentation and uh, i am sure that uh, we have two eminent speakers and experts in the field of vulture conservation dr vibhu prakash and chris uh, i am uh, i think all the participants will benefit from their experience and knowledge thank you so much thank you very much sir for the overview and to set the tone and uh, we will get back to you time permitting for questions Uh, now i welcome dr christopher g r bowden who is currently serving as the globally threatened species officer for the royal society for the protection of birds rspb and his primary role since 2004 has been coordinating the asian vulture program in south asia 
He is currently program manager for SAVE, which is Saving Asia's Vultures from Extinction, a consortium of regional and international organizations committed to the conservation of vultures in South Asia. Chris is also the co-chair of the IUCN Vulture Specialist Group since its formation in 2011. Dr. Chris has focused on threatened and critically endangered species for all of his career and was based in Morocco for seven years in 90s, uh, researching and coordinating efforts for the Northern Wild Ibis. Over the past 30 plus years, he has mainly uh, been into field-based uh, studies in Africa, Asia, UK, and the Caribbean, and has uh, primarily focused on breeding ecology and behaviors in bird species, including vultures. So over to you, sir. Chris, we cannot hear you. Uh, you will need to unmute yourself. The first red. We can see the slides. We still can't hear you. Uh, Chris, please unmute. Unmute your. Chris, please unmute. One second. Yes, we could hear you. We could hear you now. Oh, you can hear me. Great. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. And it's uh, you can hear me okay now. Yes, we can hear you uh, now clearly. Okay. Well, it's a really special honour to to be delivering this this lecture today, and thank you particularly, Dr. Yadav, and your team for inviting me to take part in this. Uh, my side of the uh, presentation will be the, the wider context uh, for the uh, ex situ um, program, but also giving you a little bit of the in situ aspects uh, and background to that. So thank you very much. I'll be giving you a global perspective initially, but then uh, actually, this story is very much an Asian story, and, and India is absolutely uh, central to, to that. So, um, so I'm just moving through to uh, the fact that uh, vultures worldwide, there are 20 vultures and condors. Um, the new world vultures and, and old world vultures are actually quite distantly related, um, but the um, old world vultures are, are the main bulk of the species and here's a slightly more friendly looking version of, of all of the old, uh, old vultures together but you'll see that when you look at those vultures um, and the threat status over half of the world's vulture species are uh, in the red list of endangered species and it, it's really, uh, especially in the old world, the threats that are responsible for, for pushing these uh, species towards extinction are actually quite different in different parts of the world. And there was a recent exercise by the Convention of Migratory Species Raptors MOU for all the old world vultures and produced this very, very helpful map of, of what the predominant threats are in different parts of the old world and actually in uh, Africa there are I mean uh, poison baits are, are probably the biggest single threat 
but even the motivation for poison baits threats are, are quite different. It can be poachers who um, want to deliberately kill vultures because they are um, showing the authorities where their poaching activities are. That's in Southern Africa and in, in West Africa, beef based use. So uh, what people might refer to as traditional medicine, although we don't believe there are any med medicinal values to, to vultures, uh, are behind some of the main deliberate threats to vultures, uh, along with some of the other hazards that they, they face. In, in Asia, it's quite different, uh, and South Asia in particular, it's predominated by the uh, veterinary drugs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the main thing, and I'll be coming on to say a bit more. But this is the multi-species action plan, um, which uh, underpins that and uh, that's available if anyone's interested. So let's, um, that's just a, a very quick flavor of what's happening worldwide. Um, of course, uh, there's an awful lot more to say, but here in Asia and India, we have nine of those 23 species in the world. So nine of them, a very high proportion of the world's vultures are found in India. Um, but the population estimates for these species uh, are really perilously low in, in, uh, in several cases. And uh, just look at that figure for slender-billed vulture there, for example, just between uh, 1,200 and 1,800 birds um, in the world. Uh, so any threat to that population is of a very, very special um, uh, significance. And oriental white-backed or white-rumped vulture at the top there um, was formerly thought to be the, um, the most abundant large raptor in the whole world. And now just look at its world population down to 8,600 individuals, a really extraordinary transformation. Um, I mean, I, I can talk a lot more about all of these, but I, I think I need to, to keep going. And, and let's look at the Indian context. And of course, we've got very special cultural value. Um, the story uh, in Hindu mythology of, of Jatayu, um, along with the significance to the Parsi community and Towers of Silence, where vultures disposed of, of dead bodies and taking people to the next world, and likewise in the high Himalaya. Um, other vultures there are, do a similar thing, but, uh, but of course they were very much part of rural everyday life um, throughout the entire country just 20 years ago. And scenes like this, um, these slides from uh, pictures from, from Delhi, um, I, I use in just about every presentation. Um, to show the um, uh, superabundance of vultures, um, uh, which uh, uh, there was quite recently. So, of course, as well as the cultural significance, we have the, the world of vultures. We got a bit of interference. Yeah. Okay. Um. Thank you. And um. And of course, uh, the estimate for India was actually f um, forty million uh, birds were found in India twenty years ago, back in the uh, early nineteen eighties, and, and uh, sorry, early nineteen nineties even, and they would dispose of vast quantities of rotting meat. And of course, um, all of that meat is now, something else happens to it. And some of that meat is now consumed by feral dogs and we all understand the threat and, and there have been significant increases of feral dogs in the, particularly in the early 2000s. Um, and rabies remains a very real threat with six, 7,000 human deaths in India every year. Uh, so human health uh, knock-on effects of losing those vultures, which uh, can't, can't be overemphasized. Now the population trends in India of, of the birds, this graph doesn't look that dramatic until you realize that that is plotted on a log logarithmic scale. 
and uh, thankfully uh, Vibhu Prakash uh, and his team did some surveys in the early 1990s where we have a, an index at least of the former abundance and threats have continued uh, and declines have continued um, in the early 2000s. Can somebody turn the microphone off? Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, uh, yes, uh, and we have some sort of stabilization of populations going on. I'm going to come back to that um, uh, at the end of the talk in terms of uh, further update. But um, uh, and in all my talks, I have to give this warning that inevitably, and people who know me know that, uh, and, and who know the vulture story, know that we have to have a strong focus on uh, the role of diclofenac, which was unraveled in the early 2000s, by 2003 and early 2004. The main cause of those dramatic declines was established very, very clearly by uh, Lindsay Oakes and his team first in Pakistan, but very quickly uh, reinforced by uh, uh, work by BNHS and, uh, and also in Nepal, where dead vultures, uh, and one common feature of a lot of the dead vultures which were being picked up was that they all had visceral gout and uh, the, these white crystals on their intestines and, and inner organs. And um, in, in the end, that was categorically linked to uh, um, when diclofenac well, causes this, um, and it actually, the, the diclofenac causes kidney failure in the vultures, and it's kidney failure that actually kills the birds. But I should just, for anyone who's not familiar, diclofenac was being used as a, as a painkiller and anti-inflammatory in uh, cattle, originally in humans, and it still, it still is used. Um, but unfortunately for vultures, when they consume a dead cow that's been treated by this drug, it is absolutely highly toxic. And any birds that did, were found dead that did not have gout um, did not have diclofenac when the tests were done. So, and, and there's more up-to-date information. Uh, this, this was what really um, sent the big, big um, message that we, uh, uh, and some actions that were needed back in 2004, which is when I started on the, uh, the Vulture program uh, in my role to try and coordinate um, the actions that were needed. So, um, and, and the, there were two key actions required. The first was removing diclofenac from the environment, which needed finding a safe alternative and, and, and getting effective bans of diclofenac. But the second and um, key priority was establishing an ex situ uh, program, a breeding program to secure at least the three species of gyps vultures. And first to secure them because the declines were going on so fast, those logarithmic scale declines. Um, and, but, but also with the um, uh, future goal for, for actually working towards a, a release program and all the benefits that that can bring. And, and I think, um, so just quickly to run through some of the in-situ conservation that, that uh, led to the bans, there was an awful lot of um, science behind it, um, a lot of publicity, um, video, and uh, Mike Pande film, a lot of um, press coverage, reaching the, uh, um, the conservation community, um, to get them on board, because actually uh, many people were very skeptical whether uh, a veterinary drug could really have caused these dramatic declines and, um, and, and discussions with government. But the Pradipto Ghosh, the, the secretary at the, at the time, was very much um, clued in on, on the science behind the need for a ban, and, and those bans came through and I think by India led the way in 2006, gazetted in 2008, and very quickly, um, well, almost simultaneously, uh, Nepal and Pakistan 
um, followed a bit later by Bangladesh, Iran, and, and most recently by Cambodia, where um, Daikathanek has just recently been found in, in veterinary use. Um, a second step in 2015 was getting human Daikathanek ban in place uh, for, for the large vials, because we found that um, large vials of human Daikathanek were not need, needed in, in human medicine, but it was actually a rather cynical move by the, the pharmaceutical companies to make it available to, to vets um, to use illegally. Um, so getting that ban, I think, was, a, was an important further step. One further um, in situ measure, which has evolved in, the, in time um, and, and has been going for at least 10 years now, is the concept of something more localized, a vulture safe zone, uh, 100 kilometer radius. Um, and these areas um, which have been where initiatives have, have taken place uh, are marked on the map there. Um, and this gives some, it, it's basically uh, targeted awareness, uh, but also um, pharmacy surveys and, uh, and other vulture surveys in, in those areas. So teams of five or six people uh, really making sure the government, um, uh, local government authorities and DFOs are all fully aware of what, what needs to happen. And they're based where there, where there are at least some vultures left. Um, I could talk a lot more about that, but just, just so you're aware that that's, that's going on. So that's um, as much as I'm going to say about the, um, the in situ work uh, up to now. So the ex situ work, which Bibu is going to tell you much more about uh, than I will now, but, but just to, to say that I've uh, be, um, been working very closely with BNHS and, and Bibu in particular to develop uh, and bring in the right expertise from, from different programs all over the world, uh, California Condor and Eurasian Griffin Vulture work, uh, Jemima Parry Jones, various experts and from South Africa very, uh, to, um, to actually pull together and, and, and get the, um, uh, the, the methodologies and expertise instilled here. And because nobody had bred these species when we started this um, back in 2004. And uh, well, I'll try not to steal too much of Vibu's uh, thunder, and I'll, I'll let him tell you more about um, about these details. But I do just want to mention that the, I mean the centres, uh, as uh, Dr. Yadav has just shown um, in in India, but there, there are just only two such centres outside India, to, just to be aware of. One in uh, in southern Nepal, and one in eastern Pakistan. But both of those are relatively smaller um, uh, than most of the centres here in India. But I'll, I'll let Bibu tell you much more about that. Another thing I wanted to explain a little bit more about is that back in 2010, um, when we'd made a lot of progress, we'd got those bands in place, we needed to review priorities, we needed a, a regional recovery plan, highlighting work and, and get communication going. And so we came up with the idea of establishing a consortium. And um, Jarem Ramesh kindly agreed to help us launch this in February 2011. And uh, we were also very, um, uh, very privileged to have uh, Professor Ian Newton, uh, probably the world's most um, leading expert on raptors, uh, who'd been taking a keen interest in it, and he agreed to be our chair for the first four years and remains very, very interested. And we really wanted to pull together all the organisations that were following the um, the uh, agreed scientific backed um, uh, actions that were needed. And I think initially we were 11 and quickly 14, but we're now up to 24 
organizations that are fully signed up. But uh, as well as those 24 that are signed up, we have the various, um, some of the, um, the state governments and uh, national governments and indeed Central Zoo Authority has been very much um, on the scene of this. Um, it's, it's, it's rather pleasing that in, in Nepal and uh, Bangladesh, the government departments were able to sign up, but we have IVRI, the Indian Veterinary Research Institute, is very much an active partner in SAVE, Saving Asia's Vultures from Extinction. And uh, the um, premise of SAVE is that we meet once a year physically, normally, maybe not this year. Um, uh, well, we may be doing it virtually, I expect, but every November we, uh, we meet and importantly, we review the regional recovery plan that we've pulled together with the key targeted actions. And for every action, those um, traffic light colors on the left represent different actions and whether we are green happy that they're going okay, or of course you can see a number of red ones which we're worried are behind schedule in terms of saving these species from extinction. And you can download that from the, the SAVE website. Um, so I think I've already touched on the, um, the threats for Asia, but even within the, so the, the region for those three gyps species actually covers uh, from Pakistan through to Cambodia. So there are actually six countries with significant or at least some kind of uh, viable population. India is predominant for, for all three of those species. Um, but, uh, but for South Asia, the threats from, from that CMS um, action plan that I showed earlier come out absolutely even now, um, despite the ban in diclofenac as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, diclofenac among them as being the top one. But in Southeast Asia, there are actually other threats which are predominant. So even within Asia, we have differences um, and the poison baits threat and in, uh, availability in Southeast Asia is definitely uh, important. Before I um, move on to the to, to summing up, I, I just want to also mention that there is a regional steering committee set up between the four South Asian governments, which is uh, running uh, in parallel and very much uh, and meets every year. And, and this is a further forum for reporting and comparing uh, how progress is going on, on the action plan. But they, they have adopted the SAVE blueprint, as we call it, the regional action plan, um, as the, um, the guidance for that. So, some quick and recent updates. Um, one thing we've actually managed to do this year is um, produced a policy statement summarizing all the, um, the key facts, but also the, those threats for, um, for India specifically, that's available um, on that link and you can uh, download that. And probably my, my favorite or most crucial part of that is unfortunately the, um, the list of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, so diclofenac is there at the bottom, which of course is banned um, as a veterinary drug in uh, across the South Asian countries. Um, but unfortunately, one thing that has emerged um, more recently is that other drugs, acyclofenac, ketoprofen, are also highly toxic to vultures. Um, mimesilide is looking a very, very serious concern. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so, but um, thankfully we have meloxicam and it was finding that meloxicam was a safe alternative at the beginning was, was a, a crucial step in terms of giving the vets an alternative drug they could use, which is largely, uh, most vets are happy with it as an alternative and, and some actually prefer it. Um, 
One thing, uh, well, I'll mention tolfenamic acid in just a moment. Uh, I mentioned that for the vulture safe zones, one of the activities is going to pharmacies and asking which drugs they're selling to the vets. And we've got a lot of information from that. And actually, there's a paper that's just been accepted this week, so will be published in the next month or two. And this, this is a preview of one of the um, figures from that paper, um, which shows when, when people go and actually uh, uh, undercover, they go and ask for a veterinary drug to cure their cow, you get much clear, better um, information than if you go openly, because many of the drugs, um, the, the pharmacies know that it's illegal to sell diclofenac, so you, you get a, a, a better picture. Um, but you will see that uh, from these undercover surveys, this drug that I've just mentioned, mimesilide, is unfortunately uh, very much available in several parts of India and being used more and more widely. And we've had at least five dead vultures with visceral gout, as I mentioned, uh, what we had been regarding as mainly a feature of dead vultures killed by um, diclofenac. But we know that, it, um, that, that when we've tested their tissues, there's been no diclofenac, nothing else obviously wrong with them, but high nimesilide in the tissues. And in Gujarat in particular, we've had some, some, um, some corpses, but we are sure that that's a, a widespread problem. So nimesilide is looking like our next biggest worry. Um, we haven't been able to do safety testing on that so far. Uh, meloxicam, which is the safe drug, you'll see is fairly available. And, and in some states, it's more available. You know, in Assam, it's, uh, it's being very widely used. So Assam may be a safer place for vultures to um, be released than, uh, than other states. So, um, but there's a lot more there, and, and you can read the paper very, very soon. This is just to mention, highlight acyclophenac particularly. It's, um, it's actually what they call a pro-drug. It's converted to diclofenac inside the cow or buffalo. Um, and you can have it in tablet form, but more worryingly, there are injectable forms which are becoming popular. Unfortunately, it's legal, so um, getting a ban of, of acyclofenac is unfortunately a very, very high priority, and any uh, anyone who knows about these things will very quickly say, oh, yes, that's exactly what it does. It turns to diclofenac, and, and we've even got some publications to prove that. So that's a big worry. Um, and But one very nice positive is that um, the IVRI, uh, with, with the help and support of, of BNHS, have been safety testing um, tolfenamic acid on... Um, on Himalayan griffins, actually, um, as uh, as a surrogate, we know Himalayan griffins are also sensitive to uh, to uh, diclofenac and NSA poisoning. Um, but sulfonamic acid is looking like it could be safe, and we're looking forward to an announcement on this very soon. It's not published yet, but uh, watch this space. That and so hopefully the vets will will be uh, cheered up a bit by um, by that. So I've been talking very much about India so far, just to switch briefly to Nepal, where uh, more regular road transect surveys have been done uh, on annually, uh, or almost annually. And the blue line there is uh, white rumped vulture population. And you will see that uh, there really is a the beginning of a population recovery there. And that is now statistically significant. And in fact, um, even for slender build vulture, it's looking ho hopeful too, although there are much smaller numbers there. But um, so in Nepal, where there's been some very intensive work to remove the, um, the NSAIDs um, more effectively, and, and uh, it's backed up, there's a lot more information again in this uh, paper, which will be published soon. And I don't have time to go into the detail of that, but. Um, which backs up that Nepal is indeed a lot safer. And there is this small breeding center there. And the first white rumped vultures, the first three sets of white rumped vultures have been released with satellite tags 
and uh, that is very much um, going rather well. That's the release theory on the right. Um, the um, some of the birds from that uh, release in Chitwan on the edge of Chitwan National Park, there in, in uh, near the UP border, um, had uh, up until in, really in the first year they hadn't been um, uh, they hadn't been um, moving very far at all, really only up to ten kilometres, but. Since the pandemic, and we don't know all the reasons why, uh, but since March this year, they've suddenly started moving and including crossing into India and causing all sorts of um, um, uh, crazy stories about whether they're spies, spies and all sorts of things. So, I mean, important that the, um, the science and the uh, knowledge and understanding of everyone is that these are really important birds which are um, pioneers in, in, in the release program from Nepal and we hope that um, we will be seeing and in, Bibi will be telling us a bit more about uh, where we are with the releases planned here in India um, but we have had pilot releases here in India for Himalayan griffins so far and, and indeed one in West Bengal in December uh, with the first satellite tracked birds, uh, which are doing doing well. So um, that is going to be the next step. And had COVID not come along, we, we were all set to do our first release in Haryana in, in March, but uh, hopefully we can do that soon. I think I've covered that um, we're um, just back to the other updates. Uh, this is actually a new initiative and a new consortium formed in Myanmar, where there's small populations uh, of two or three of the, uh, the vulture species. But this slide summarizes all the key priorities which we know are, are needed for, for vultures across South Asia. And um, the immediate withdrawal of licenses for a cyclophanic ketoprofen, well, nemesilide, the safety testing has to be completed by IBRI, and, and that's so, so urgent. Um, but th those are top, top priority. Um, getting the tests completed and published for the tolphanamic acid, ultra safe zone work, and getting that up and running, and getting more people involved. I think um, at the moment, um, there's a lot of potential for more organisations and more participation from uh, government authorities in supporting uh, vulture safe zone work across the country will be uh, really important, um, which will be one way of monitoring the drug availability, um, but also monitoring the causes of vulture mortality and getting dead vultures and finding out what they died of is a priority and something that we will um really hoping to do more of there but um and right at the end there i squeezed in releases and that's um probably should have its own heading really because the releases are going to be the crucial part of um finding out well and, and that's maybe jumping to the second point there so how is ex situ work actually helping the conservation of these species and Yes, um, back in 2004, getting birds, birds into those breeding centres was very much uh, just conserving the, the genetic stock, um, making sure they didn't go totally extinct because uh, that, that was um, uh, crucial. Developing the methodology for, for breeding, um, but of course as a source for birds to release and, and the releases are a way of testing just how safe the environment is. And then uh, also as a focus, I, th I think if we didn't have these breeding centres, uh, there wouldn't be the same focus for actually uh, people to come to and to get involved in like the safety testing of IBRI has all been done in connection with, um, with the breeding centres, even though we're, we're uh, we're not using those birds except for the very final uh, 
uh, final check on, on any safety testing, but, but that's a really important um, reason why ex situ work, uh, and I must admit, you know, ex situ work is not something that, um, you know, I work for the Royal Society of Protecting the Birds, um, well, I'm based here in Bangalore, um, but um, from the UK, and, and, you know, we don't get involved in ex situ work very often, but this is such a, um, such a, an emergency operation. It's something that really, really needs doing. Uh, and we ended up managing to bring some funding to, to get, to help get these centers up, up and running. But, but there is a very real worry and risk that that funding is, is not enough and not, not uh, regular enough. And, and so that, that is a major concern. Um, the question at the top there, are populations recovering well in Nepal they, they definitely are showing signs of recovery where the those drugs are coming down in in um, in proportion um, but in India I think the the short answer is uh, not really yet I think they're stabilizing um, but the indications and and Bibus and his teams, um, 7,000 kilometer road transect surveys, uh, again, were due to be repeated this year. So we would have had a, an update on, on how, um, how well things are going or not. Um, it, that's, that's had to be postponed for another year. Um, but then there's actually the State of India's birds index has come up and, and the indications from that is that there are still um, 10 and 15 percent declines per year coming through. Um, that's citizen science data which is, um, needs verification, but the signs are not conclusive and not, not, not very good. In Gujarat, the an annual surveys are showing uh, ongoing declines. Madhya Pradesh may be a little bit better, but, but those, um, those surveys uh, really need repeating uh, a little bit more often. So I hope that we are getting there. Ex situ has a massive role to play in this, in supplying for the, um, um, for the release program, but also maintaining the stocks of birds for the future. And um, if you do want to be put onto a, um, a mailing list for, for further updates, but you can always look at the SAVE website there. And um, I think that's, I've managed to do it more or less on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chris. That was spot on in terms of time and also for the amount of information and the new insights that you have uh, given. Uh, it is extremely uh, useful, especially uh, in, in many ways an eye opener. Uh, in terms of the drugs that we can use and also in terms of what the vultures are doing during the lockdown period. So in a way, you've also responded to some of the questions which are coming up on the YouTube channel. And uh, if time permitting, we will get back to you on that. And thanks once again. Uh, so I will now move on to the next speaker, which is Dr. Vibhu Prakash. Uh, Dr. Vibhu Prakash is the principal scientist uh, and deputy director of Bombay National History Society and head of the Vulture Conservation Program of the Society. He has been working on raptors and vultures uh, since 1984, and he and his team, along with support of the state forest departments, have initiated the vulture conservation breeding programs at Haryana, West Bengal, Assam, and Madhya Pradesh. Uh, VCBC Pinjor has been recognized as the coordinating zoo for vulture conservation in the country by Caesar Day, and the program has been successful in breeding all the three critically endangered just species of vultures. So over to you, sir. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. And I am really grateful to Dr. S.P. Yadav and Dr. Sonali Ghosh for giving me this opportunity to talk on vultures. I will be giving my presentation on the three critical And this like double vulture. You know, these three species of vultures were very common till a couple of decades ago, and we had an estimate about four pro uh, uh, population of these species. 
and most of them perished because of the use of a veterinary drug called diclofenac. And now they are all critically endangered as which we have lost 99% of the population. And uh, uh, conservation breeding program has been initiated as uh, an insurance against extinction. Uh, the Central Zoo Authority, uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's in the top priority list of Central Zoo Authority for conservation breeding and recovery program. And all the three species are in the top two of the list. The Central Zoo Authority has identified Vulture Conservation Breeding Center Pinjar as the coordinating zoo, and it has provided technical support as well as funding support to five other centers in the country. And it provides, continues to provide technical support to other centers through the uh, coordinating zoo for running of. Similarly, uh, um, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Government of India, in its action plan in 2006, identified conservation breeding for the three gyp species of vultures as the most important action to save them from possible extinction. As we have lost 99% of the population. The Central Zoo Authority has also developed a manual for setting up the vulture conservation breeding program for the husbandry and care and for the running of the center and especially the management. The husbandry and care guidelines and protocols developed in this program are based on the experience of the conservation, vulture conservation breeding center at Pinjar. And uh, you know, it is, uh, well, the conservation breeding program is not difficult, but if unless if the guidelines are followed to the hilt, then we will be successful. And this manual is very helpful in that. So when we start, we thought of doing conservation breeding program, the immediate question was how many birds we should breed, because it's not difficult to breed birds if you give them the right condition, but you should breed uh, the number of birds which can be released back and can perform the ecological role. So we thought of, uh, we did a mathematical modeling and thought of of each of the three species back in the wild. And to get 600 pairs of each of the three species, we thought of establishing at least six different centers in the country. And, at, and from each centers, we thought of releasing 100 pairs in the wild. And to get 100 pairs, we thought of having 25 founder pairs in each of the centers. And because vultures, you know, they are long living and you can age vultures till they are five years old, not beyond that. So a five years old or 40 years old vultures will look alike. And because we now want to have known age birds in the conservation breeding program, so we collected nestlings and juveniles. 70% were nestlings and juveniles and rest were adults and sub-adults, which, which we thought would, be, would act as guide birds to these young birds. So now we have eight different centers, conservation breeding centers in the country. Pinjar, Rajabhat, Kawa, Rani, and Bhopal are run by the state forest departments in collaboration with Bombay Natural Society. And the rest of the four centers are sponsored by the Central Authority and they are in the state zoos as satellite facilities and are run by the state zoos and uh, technical support is provided by the uh, coordinating zoo. So this is a typical layout plan of a conservation breeding program. You know, a conservation breeding program should be uh, in the natural distribution of the species, and it should be away from poultry farms or animal collections like zoos, because then there's a serious risk of disease transmission. And Pingjar Center is ideally located for that. So at center, we have number of different aviaries for different purposes and different age class of birds. And as you know, when you keep birds in captivity, disease is a serious concern. So we have very good quarantine facilities for birds. So when the birds are brought in the center, they are straight away taken to the quarantine facility where they are kept for 45 days. And if after the health, they are found healthy, they are brought to the centers. And 45 days is the incubation period of the most prevalent disease in AVES, that is the Ranicate disease. And if these birds are carrying disease, it will appear in 45 days. And birds, when they are brought to the center, they are already kept in the nursery every or in the holding every if they are uh, juveniles or in the colony every, which are our largest averies in the center. 
Vultures are social birds, have to be kept in flocks. So we have our largest aviary is 100 feet long, 40 feet wide and 20 feet high. And in this we can keep 30 plus birds easily. And the uh, aviary is uh, well ventilated. It has all facilities for the birds. It has water troughs, pulches and all. And you know, uh, vultures are uh, big birds of prey and these large birds of prey, the problem comes when you keep them in captivity is in their feet. So uh, in, uh, when they are uh, out in open in the wild, they are most of the time up in the sky and soaring, but when they are in captivity, they have to be, uh, be perched. And that pro creates problem in their feet. So they develop pressure sores in their foot pad and that can become uh, develop into a disease called bumblefoot. It gets infected and it's very difficult to treat. But you can easily overcome it by giving them a rough surface to perch on. And so what we do, we just want coconut drop on the perches and then uh, we don't get disease. So, and the we have other aviaries also at the center like the spray aviary, hospital aviary for keeping sick birds and breeding aviaries for keeping pairs which don't feel comfortable breeding in colony aviaries. Because we have a conservation breeding program, so all our birds are marked because it's very important to know the genetics of the breeding birds. So we uh, put a wing tag, we also ring the birds and we also put a microchip which is forever and we uh, keep all their mi micro my morphometrics electronically. So all information is stored from, for all the birds uh, which we have uh, right from the beginning and we know which bird is breeding with whom. We, uh, we catch all our birds once in a year and give them a thorough health check just to make sure they are healthy. And we bleed 10% of the bird and check their blood samples and uh, just to ensure they are doing fine. And if there's any problem, then we treat them. Otherwise, we don't give them any uh, anti helminths or any vaccines or anything because these birds have to be left uh, back in the wild. We also have developed good uh, laboratory facilities because for avian diseases, there are very few facilities in the country. Even to get a uh, blood analyze of birds is difficult. So we have tried to develop these facilities in our centers. So we can do the hematology, biochemistry, and you know, these birds are not sexually dimorphic. So you cannot make out a male from a female. You can do it only through their DNA. So we do have a small genetic lab and also a microbiology to study their gut flora and bone. And feeding food is, the, is another very important aspect of uh, you know, conservation breeding. And as you know, most of our vultures perished because of the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially diclofenac. So what we do, we keep goats with us for seven days. And if they have been treated with diclofenac, it, the diclofenac is excreted out within 72 hours. And then we skin the goats and we give the entire carcasses to the vultures. One vulture, uh, we feed vultures twice a week, just to mimic what is the conditions in the wild. And each vulture gets four kilos of meat per week. That works out to be 5% of its body weight. And that's how, uh, normal living being feeds uh, and we in fact try to little underfeed the vultures because they are in captivity and don't spend that much energy and and they keep themselves fit so this is how they feed you know the, as soon as the food is given all of them uh, jump white back vultures long billed and slender will vulture they like to wait for a day or so and then come and uh, they very quickly finish the food and there is no hierarchy the hungry bird is dominant, not the powerful one. And we usually we try to keep one species in a aviary because uh, although they cannot interbreed, they can form pairs and that is used. And vultures love to take bath. So we have given, uh, we have good number of water troughs and we top them off every morning. If you, do, if you don't do it, they will not take bath. So after food, they always take bath and it is almost one by one. No fights, they are very civilized. And the vultures, they like to uh, get a lot of sun, so they spread the wings whenever there's bright sunshine. And this is largely to shed ectoparasites and thermoregulate, have their plumage in good shape. And uh, because vultures, 
the wings or uh, flying around, they do it together. And you see how calm they are. They are in captivity. If they are, uh, I guess they breed successfully. And if to keep them in flocks, they are very comfortable, even in captivity. And aviaries are very well ventilated, a lot of air. Whenever there is gush of wind, these will strike to exercise. They do vigorous wind exercise because there is wind and they keep their wings in good shape. Their pectoral muscles remain in good and wild. I'm sure they will be able to fly. Absolutely no problem. And uh, because they are again social birds, all the birds in the aviary will be doing this. They will be, whenever there's gush of wind, they, because, you know, bird at back is a juvenile and the bird in front is an adult. It, it takes, uh, um, uh, uh, it takes plumage, but once a bird is adult, it's very difficult to age it because a five years old or a 40 years old birds look similar. So that's why we have collected, you know, have the known sex birds. And uh, these birds are, uh, you know, they start breeding when they are five to six years old, but they start are three to four years old. When uh, a, fem a male usually offers a twig to the female and the female twig, it, they become hair and hair for life. If one of them dies, it is immediately replaced. Uh, the nesting at the center takes place like there in the wild. And uh, they share all the duties of nesting together. Yeah. From the ground and bring them to the uh, nest. Some of the pairs, they build nest for almost two months, but some of them just make a scrap and then lay an egg. And uh, building nest also increases the pair bonding. Uh, we have CCC cameras in all our centers and you, we, have, we could also record egg laying by this bird. Birds usually lay uh, during evening, uh, during the dusk and dawn. And uh, without any disturbance, we can do all observations. And uh, once egg is laid, both the birds help in incubating. And they uh, take turns to incubate the eggs. And it, it takes almost 55 days for the birds, uh, for the eggs to hatch. They, uh, uh, they almost never leave the leg alone, but they do stand up and roll the egg just to make sure that it uh, the, it, it gets heat on all the sides and uh, and usually they have very long incubation shift so the bird uh, stress themselves off and on just to keep them in in shape so you will see how well this bird stretches uh, it, the incubation shift can be eight to ten hours also and the egg hatches at uh, about 55 days. And the bird, the chick which hatches, usually have a very sparse coat of down. And it is not able to thermoregulate. So the parents sit over the chick to uh, keep it warm. And it lasts for 45 days. Uh, and then it is, the chick is, uh, 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 it can be left alone. Feeding is, uh, you know, the birds, they bring the food in the crop and they regurgitate in the nest and chick picks it up. So whenever the parents are on the nest, the chick is constantly pecking at the beak, uh, inducing the bird to regurgitate. And the other partner is always there when the chick is being fed. And it appears that it's trying to control the size of morsel which comes out, probably because they uh, feel that it can choke the chick. And you know that when the chick about 150 grams, but within three to four months, it becomes four to five kilos. So the growth is very fast and the calcium requirement is very, very high. So the birds, they bring really big bones for the chicks. 
and they feed them on. And you know, because these uh, chicks, the birds, vultures have a very acidic digestive tract, they can uh, very easily digest the bones also, and it, it gets dissolved. And you'll see how what a big bone it brings out from its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, crop, and the chick just feeds on it. And the birds, uh, you know, uh, uh, the vulture chick, it takes almost two months to start standing up. And if it doesn't do that, then we are worried because then there can be problem with calcium deficiency. And if the chick has calcium deficiencies, it's almost impossible to save it because uh, it develops metabolic bone disease and dies. So we have to be very careful in getting giving the right amount of uh, calcium. So as Dr. Yadav said, we have got now about 750 birds in various breeding centers, and most of the birds are Pinjor, Baksa, and Rani. We have about 354 birds at Pinjor. And it is because we, we, we have bred almost 400 chicks so far in, all, in the different breeding centers, and of them, 274 are just from Pinjor. And it is lastly because in Pinjor, we do artificial incubation and double clutching. So, you know, when uh, the, uh, 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 the vultures usually lay one egg per year, but if the egg fails for certain reasons, it, uh, it uh, uh, lays again within uh, 15 to 20 days. So we take advantage of this and we remove the egg if 10 days after it has been laid and we artificially incubate it. The birds then relay again and, and, uh, the, we, and they incubate the second clutch. So the egg is then brought to the incubator, the incubator room, which is thermocontrolled, which is maintained at 19 to 23 degrees. And these are tabletop uh, hot air uh, uh, incubators and four eggs can be incubated in each of them. And we incubate eggs at 36.6, 30.6.9 degrees centigrade. And we keep a close watch weight of the egg because the eggs for successful hatch should lose between 14 to 17 percent of his weight by, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is losing, uh, uh, it is losing too much weight, then what we do is we increase it. And it is it's quite simple, there are wells in the incubator and you, we just pour water in it. And so incubation, uh, humidity is increased very quickly and uh, we can control the weight loss again. And when the, when the uh, uh, egg is losing too much weight, when egg is not losing enough weight, then we act and uh, we, uh, we can usually hatches. We also are doing candling, and it, 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 you can actually see the embryo inside and the various blood loss. It's a good way of monitoring the growth of chick. And uh, uh, we usually uh, turn uh, the incubator. Uh, uh, once in uh, once we are, but also every uh, every uh, three times a day, every uh, uh, every day, just to give them even heat all, all around. So, and you know, till forty days, you you think the egg is dead because you hardly see any moment movement in the egg. But after 40 days, if you keep it on a firm surface, the egg starts twitching. And that's when you know that egg has life and it becomes very exciting. And when the egg is 52 days in incubation, it actually cracks itself, which we call external pit. Two days before that, it starts calling from inside. And then in 55 days, <laughs> And when the egg, uh, when the chick hatches, it has got uh, a very sparse coat of down. Uh, 
and uh, it uh, uh, for the first day we don't feed the for the first 12 hours we don't feed the chicks at all and then and the first day it just sleeps and from second day onwards we just we give it two uh, grams of meat three times a day and then we keep monitoring its weight and we make sure that the first three days the weight doesn't increase by more than seven percent and uh, and uh, till 28 day the weight doesn't increase by more than nine percent and if we can do that the uh, chick uh, grows successfully from third day onwards we also give the chick different kinds uh, different organs of the uh, animal like the heart liver and all and but uh, we make sure that the weight doesn't increase too much because you know it's very easy to overfeed a chick and kill it than to underfeed so we always make the show and calcium requirement is very high so 1% of the total diet is always calcium carbonate so this is how we feed the chick and keep a close eye on its weight Okay. And uh, you know, after every three days old, we keep them out in sun because they require vitamin D3 for calcium assimilation. If they don't get this, they will uh, they cannot assimilate calcium and they will have problems. And then they are uh, they are kept in sun only for half an hour. Then then they are kept in brooder boxes for another five days and the temperature is regularly brought down and but they are kept in uh, in uh, in groups so they imprint on each other not on us so when they, the chicks are about 10 to 15 days old they are given back to the parents and since vultures have hardly any sense you can give it any chick and they will accept it so the uh, chick the first clutch chick is given uh, to the uh, to the bird and take the second egg and the second egg is incubated by us again and the chick is then reared by the parents and this is how they are uh, 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 and this is how we have increased the hatchability of the second clutch by almost 70 percent and uh, we rear the chicks all uh, in group flocks in groups to avoid imprinting because imprinting could be a very serious problem in captive breeding when the chicks started uh, uh, thinking that once of its kind, if after 10 days we expose it to the, to the bird. And the chicks, they fledge when they are 110 days old or so, 120 days old, and they are then shifted to the uh, holding areas. Now we have bred enough number of chicks and we uh, and the diclofenac prevalence has also gone down. So we are we have we are thinking of start initiating the reintroduction program. So this year we are we will be re releasing some more in from Pinjaw Center into the wild. So we monitor uh, the prevalence of drugs in cattle carcasses all across the country by uh, going and collecting liver samples from cattle carcass carcasses from the carcass dumps. So, you know, before the ban, there were over 11% of the carcasses at diclofenac, but till uh, 2013, the percentage has come down to 2% in the carcasses, and now it has further come down. And with the restriction on the size of the human vials, which were being misused in treating cattle, we hope that the uh, prevalence of diclofenac will still come down. So when we release the birds, it's not going to be like we will just lift the uh, 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 netting and the birds will be free to go. We will not do that. We will do a soft release. So we have prepared a pre-release aviary, which is very open. So birds can see all around. In, and the aviary is in the habitat where the birds will be uh, will, are going to be released. And they also get exposed to the other animals and the predators which they will get. Although they are still in their enclosure, but they can see all of them. And uh, because we, uh, when we release the birds, we will be putting satellite tags on them or the tracking devices. So they will have to carry some weight. So 
just to make uh, make them used to carry weights, we put dummy tags on them before releasing them to free reduce every. And and you know all our conservation breeding centers are off display, so they are all, they are not uh, for public. But since we now have to release ba birds back in the wild, we need support from the public. So what the best way is to invite public figures to the center. And so we what we did, we invited the chief minister of Haryana to release the bird pre-release Avery. And that proved to be very helpful. And uh, because of the a lot of publicity we got. This how a release every looks like the world birds can see all around. We also have crows now to get in, so vultures will know what to ex expect when they are in the wild and also see other free ranging uh, vultures because we attract free ranging vultures just outside the aviaries. And we uh, and uh, we hope that there is good interaction between our captive bred birds, which are inside. And the free release uh, uh, and the free ranging work which are outside, and uh, because vultures are social birds, once they are they will be released, they are surely going to join the wild free ranging birds, and then their survival will be much better. See, this is how the interaction takes place. The bird, the dark bird, free ranging bird, and this young bird is inside, and they. The free ranging world wants to come inside and the bird in captivity wants to go outside. You know, the grass on the other side is always greener. So uh, uh, what we have done so far, we have released two Himalayan griffins because they were in captivity with us for 10 years. And many people think that the birds which remain in captivity for so long, when they are released out in the open, they will not be able to fly. Although we knew that the way, way we have kept birds, we, uh, these birds will be able to fly once they are released uh, back in the wild. But nevertheless, we thought we will release them first and see what happens. So that's how we did a test release in and, uh, 2016. Those days we didn't have uh, PTT, the tracking device. So, and I released them. We had invited the Honorable Union Minister to come and release the birds back. So he came in June 2016 and the birds were released in the world. So he came and opened the gates on the 3rd June, but for the next 24 hours, the birds just didn't go out anywhere. They just kept sitting. We had provided them with nice juicy goat. We had also given water. The Free ranging birds also came and fed, but these birds didn't move. Exactly 24 after we had lifted the gate, these birds showed signs of going out. They apparently knew that the cages are open and they can go and see how quickly, uh, how they went out of the uh, cage without dashing anywhere. Almost like professionals, they went out. Let's see how they just went out the gate and crashing anywhere. So, so for another 10-15 days, the birds remain close to the center and we will provi provide food, which it will feed with free-ranging vultures and will behave exactly like a wild bird, but it was scared of us. It will not come to us asking for food. And within a month's time, the birds started soaring and flying. It would avoid trees. It will not dash anywhere. There were also power pylons. There were uh, electricity wires and everything. But it will look for thermals and then it will start climbing as a typical wild world will do. And we were very pleased with it. And remember, this bird was in captivity for 10 years in our center. And then it was released back. This bird will also interact with the free ranging birds. The smaller birds will mob it, but it will kind of not mind anything and uh, it will keep flying. But after 45 days, this bird 
disappeared in the clouds and went northwards and we could not trace it. And since it didn't have a tracking device, we could not find out where it has gone. Although we did circulate these pamphlets all over and people did call us up twice or thrice, but after that we didn't hear about it. But by the time it, it was in Laos, we could monitor it for 45 days by 10 different teams following it. It had started finding its own food and water. So I'm sure it would have survived after that. And now we are going to uh, uh, reintroduce the critically endangered white-backed vulture. We are going to uh, release six of captive bred vultures and two wild caught adults into the wild. And we hope these wild caught adults will add to the bird, our captive bred birds. And we have obtained the satellite uh, tags and the other tracking devices for these vultures. And we are also making sure that in a hundred kilometers radius from the center, the environment is safe for the birds, especially there is little prevalence of uh, diclofenac and other toxic drugs. There is food and there is no other threat to the vultures. So this is the 100 kilometer radius which we are monitoring. We are especially monitoring the wild vultures population, food uh, going to the carcasses dump and actually uh, counting the number of carcasses available and we we think there's a lot of food for the vultures. There's no problem. Habitat is very good. There's no absolutely no problem. Prevalence of diclofenac has gone down, but it is still there a bit. And we are trying to make sure that the human diclofenac is not used for veterinary uh, for treating cattle. Of course, there is problem with acyclofenac and uh, nemosolide, which we are working with authorities to make sure it is not used for cattle. And we are so far getting good support from all the five state governments which are there in 100 kilometers radius from the sector. And that's all I have to say. And uh, we are not alone. We have uh, help from a number of national and international organizations, and of course, from the Forest Department. And Mr. Minister of Environment and Forest and Environment Change has always been a big supporter. Thank you very much. And that's all I had to say. And I will happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was very, very informative, and I think uh, many of the questions which we are now seeing in the chat box uh, have been answered in your presentation. I'll request all three of the speakers to uh, switch their videos and microphones on. Uh, I think I'll take a couple of questions because uh, many of them have already been answered. Uh, but uh, perhaps one question to you, uh, Dr. Vibhu Prakash, first. Uh, and of course, obviously, you've mentioned that uh, uh, the question is that, yes, uh, that what will be, uh, when will the Jatayu Vulture Breeding Center conduct its release of the captive bred vultures? You have mentioned yes. that it will be when you get the uh, satellite tra transmitter permissions. Uh, but having said that, the question is that uh, how much management of dogs, feral, free ranging in and around release sites is crucial for vultures as well? Uh, so, so yeah, so two questions bundled into one for you. Well, uh, I, I may not be clear, but we have obtained permission and we have also obtained the satellite tags. We have got now eight of them and we will be putting on vultures and we uh, this winter and uh, as far as uh, dogs are concerned you know uh, uh, like uh, I've been working on vultures for the captive breeding program and we will uh, we will spread a carcass to attract vultures and what what we will do we'll make sure that a dog comes believe they will, they, we will not be able to attract vultures on the carcass. Unless the dog comes, the vultures don't really come. So I don't think dogs are that big a threat. Uh, only the, you know, the, we are taking care that we will release vultures with the free uh, talk of free ranging vultures. So there will be number of vultures with them. And the other thing is we will be provisioning food for vultures very close to the center. And we hope that they will initial days 
they will be uh, uh, they will remain close to the center and, and then it, they, it this will not be a problem right thank you so much uh, Dr. Pratash. i'll move on to dr chris uh, again two questions bundled for you uh, is that uh, what derivatives are poachers targeting vultures for obviously not in india but uh, in the other regions that you showed and how do we create awareness for the vulture safe zones what do you think should be the awareness outreach uh, activities and especially zoos across the country do you think they can act and uh, help in awareness building okay thank you very much um in africa the poachers they're not interested mostly in the vultures at all in terms of products they just don't want the vultures to be around to um to indicate where the, there's a dead elephant or rhino so because the authorities use them to find poached animals so the, the um they call that sentinel poaching um uh, is is the term we use but that's not to be confused with the belief-based use uh poisoning which is for products and and there are various parts and bones and the head in particular that are have got some very strange beliefs about what what people can do with them so so that's that one um on the um awareness related yes and, and i i mean there's a lot more i could say about vulture safe zones generally um but but awareness and, and i'm sure that is more that um or there are various things that zoos could do to highlight you know the threats actually the um that short brochure that i mentioned on the um on the policy summary you know there's materials there that could be conveyed about uh why vultures have disappeared and getting those scientific facts clear in people's minds and uh, actually messages to the veterinary community above all and the of course for every qualified vet there are three uh, 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 para vets or quacks um, so there's a whole range of people to reach in terms of the end users of people who are buying these drugs um, and the, you know the pharmacy outlets themselves but um, so I mean there's, there are a number of uh, ways in which you can reach those community groups and we're at, we're developing a bit more detail on the vulture safe zone work at the moment from the other countries uh, and just to mention that in in Bangladesh the the two vulture safe zones there they've only got relatively smaller populations but both those populations have got a vulture safe zone centered there and the government has actually taken uh, the the uh, very major step of gazetting those as um, for, formally uh, and legally, so any drug restrictions and things can be implemented on a, a vulture safe zone scale. Uh, and and but, but the effectiveness of these, I mean, I think the Nepalese example that I mentioned is is, is something which really shows that uh, this kind of approach and community approach um the fairly grassroots stuff uh it can be effective but it needs to be right from uh from top to bottom in terms of having um all levels of of government aware as well as local community leaders and and others and the veterinarians are the, are the key group um i could go on but i think that's probably uh, largely answers it do, do look at the materials on the SAVE website, would be my further follow-up. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Due to paucity of time, I'll just uh, wind up and ask the last question to Dr. Yadav, sir. Uh, so the question is interesting. Uh, uh, will creation of a separate national authority on conservation of birds in the country help vulture conservation? Okay. Uh before we consider the creation of national authority for vulture conservation we have to see two things what is the status of population what is the trend of population and what are the existing mechanism what are the government's strategy to save vultures at this moment if you see the population we have seen 
a decline, uh, severe decline as the, the Vibhu Prakash mentioned, from the crores, the population declined to thousands. And but now we are seeing an uh, upward movement, uh, upward trend in the population. In certain pockets, the populations are doing in uh, in situ very well. So the population uh, is showing a very positive sign. Number one. Number two, if you see the government of India's approach to vulture conservation, ex situ through CJ, uh, the vulture conservation is on priority. Similarly, for in situ conservation also under integrated. Uh, development of wildlife habitat program of Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. The vulture conservation is also listed among the top 20 endangered species and that is getting a priority. So, uh, I think in my personal opinion, this is uh, not the right stage to create a separate authority for wild, uh, con uh, conservation of vultures in India. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sirs, and uh, it was fantastic and wonderful to have all of you. Uh, all our registered participants uh, get a copy of your presentations, and uh, we will uh, handhold and continue to take your guidance uh, for the next uh, coming months and, and expect and uh, help uh, seek your help for guiding us further. So thank you so much, and with this, we end this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vivu Prakash. We will be looking so much, forward sir. for further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank the you. team in Team Mysuru and the CZA team, uh, they are thanked for all the wonderful support today. Thank you.